chemos a, you know, a month um, or, or less than five a week, I guess, is the standard that they've, uh, they've indicated that instead of building a complete negative pressure clean room to do that volume of chemotherapy, if you use a closed systems tran transfer device inside an isolator or a hood, that's an acceptable alternative for low volume operations. Cleaning, uh, sterilizing, decontamination, that's another uh, point of, of uh, diversion between USB 797 and NIOSH. USB 797 really focuses on sterilization and preventing antimicrobial contamination, whereas NIOSH talks a lot more about decontaminating your work area. And unfortunately, they left it kind of vague where they say, well, you should use an appropriate deactivation agent. Well, what is that? You know, they haven't said yet. And, you know, what we do is we actually use uh, a cationic soap solution a bleach solution, a deactivator, and then a final alcohol um, rub down, I guess. Um, and that's not to deactivate, that's really just to sterilize. So I don't know if there's a gold standard out there yet. Um, it would be nice if they actually told us what that would be, but they've left it fairly vague. That may be forthcoming. Personal protective equipment is another issue where there are some discrepancies between the two. Um, USP talks about you know, non-shedding gowns, NIOSH takes the additional step of saying that our gowns uh, should actually be uh, coated, uh, polyethylene coated as opposed to polypropylene coated. So when you go back to work, it's worth checking to see are your gowns polyethylene coated or polypropylene coated. Polyethylene is a lot more impervious to spills than polypropylene. Um, those can actually leak through. And that's very consistent with the European standards as well. Gloves are, uh, is another uh, one. Um, point of diversion, which, which has actually had been rectified in the, uh, in the most recent revisions. USP talks about using protective gloves. NIOSH takes the additional step of saying that if you're working with hazardous medications, your gloves should be labeled and certified as chemotherapy gloves. And you should actually be double gloving uh, whenever you're working with hazardous medications. Those standards have actually been incorporated exactly into the USP revision. So for hazardous medications, USP is now saying the same thing, chemo gloves only and, and double glove. So again, it's worth checking. You know, the gloves you're using are actually certified as, as chemo gloves. The gowning sequence that USP 797 um, originally published was a major problem because they had us putting on our gowns first, and then the, uh, the head and facial covers, face mask, shoe covers, and then washing our arms and hands all the way up to the elbow, and then lastly putting on the gloves. But if you had a good chemo gown, you should have a tight-fitting tight wrist cuff so if you follow that gowning sequence, it was impossible to wash your hands and arms up to the elbow because you couldn't push that cuff up that high. So they went back and, uh, and revised that. Um, the current revisions now are, are a lot more common sense. They, they say that you know, we should put our personal protective equipment on basically from dirtiest to cleanest activity. So you know, put the shoe covers on, the hair and facial covers, the mask and the eye shield, wash your hands, and then put the gown on and then in the uh, clean room, actually use like one of those antiseptic alcohol-based cleaners, do a final hand cleansing, and then put your gloves on. A lot more common sense, that works. And that's pretty similar to what they do in the ORs. Medical surveillance uh, has, has been a topic that's been getting a lot of uh, attention lately. Uh, NIOSH suggests that we should all have a medical surveillance program in place for all of our workers who are exposed to hazardous drugs on a, on a routine basis. They should, that should include a medical history, physical exams and selected lab tests. Also, uh, they suggest that we might want to do environmental sampling. Very similar to what's uh, in place in Europe right now. Uh, almost all of the, uh, the pharmacies in Europe that are handling hazardous medications, all the chemo pharmacies over there, uh, they do routine medical exams on their employees. Um, the pharmacists and technicians that I spoke to, they all did follow-up exams in either one or two years, and, and most of those in, involved laboratory tests as well as a physical uh, from a physician. We've, we've been working on this for about two years, and we actually just finished our policy off uh, last month at PNT. We're going to implement it in July. So this is what we're going to do. We're actually going to use the Occupational Medicine Clinic um, at the university to support this program. So all of our technicians, pharmacists, nurses, any of our, our healthcare workers that actually are exposed to hazardous drugs with a high risk uh, for contamination on a routine basis um, will be part of this program. They're gonna get a baseline physical and a lab battery, and then we're gonna repeat that uh, every two years. 
And then if there's any acute exposure, within two working days, we'll have them uh, get a focused physical exam at, at the clinic. So hopefully, with, with that in place, you know, we can have baseline laboratory tests. And if we see any changes, you know, we'll be able to act. USP, um, their surveillance is mainly product-focused. Product and a lot of that comes from the, the uh, compounding industry. And what they're focused on is, is establishing sterility assurance levels. I think you're all familiar with the uh, requirement for personnel annual testing you know, with the media fill um, for low, medium, and, and high risk uh, compounding operations. And this uh, table just kind of summarizes uh, the, re the revisions from the uh, USP, the most recent ones, on all of the different testing. So for our facilities, you know, your hoods and your facilities still have to be certified every six months. But it's very interesting that they added the suggestion that we actually do wipe samples in our pharmacies that are compounding um, chemotherapies. So they suggest we look either for cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, methotrexate, or, or 5-FU, and that we do that every six months. And cyclophosphamide is probably the one that most people are focused on because it is an IR group one carcinogen. And they're suggesting that if you end up with any concentrations um, greater than one um, nanogram per square centimeter, you should initiate corrective action. And it was interesting when we, when we did our study, we saw some areas that were up to about 12, 12 and a half nanograms per square centimeter. So we had some really hot spots, um, as did most, uh, most of the other places that have done this testing. So that's, uh, that's interesting that they, would, uh, they would take the step of recommending that. Um, in terms of air sampling, um, the one change that they made there is we used to be able to use the, the static settling plates. You can't do that anymore. They're saying that you can only use the electric air samplers now to sample uh, air, air quality. Glove tips, uh, they're suggesting you do contact plates. Um, test your glove tips weekly uh, or daily for high risk compounding. And then it's not mandated, but it's suggested that you also use the contact plates and test the work surfaces in your hood uh, for microbial contamination. So, in summary, I mean, I could talk about this topic pretty much all day or all week, but I've tried to hit some of the the highlights with the changes that are really germane to our practice in, in oncology pharmacy or handling hazardous drugs anywhere in our organizations. Um, it's, it's interesting, you know, for, for us, USP 797 compliance is mandatory. Um, the recent change in the Joint Commission perspective kind of throws that into, into question, though, depending on what state you practice in, you know, what's the impetus to comply uh, with 797. NIOSH, I think, presents some great guidelines. Um, which may become standard of practice. ASHP is just coming out with their new training um, manual for handling hazardous medications. Much of what's in NIOSH has been incorporated into the ASHP manual. Other organizations like ONS, Oncology Nursing Society, have also incorporated elements of NIOSH, so it may just become the standard of practice. And then there's still the potential for OSHA to actually adopt elements of NIOSH and, and make that uh, also a, a regulatory mandate. The other interesting thing is USP is a moving target. You know, it's not a one and done type of thing. We continually have to be aware of what those changes are and what we have to do as practitioners to be in compliance. And then we know that elements of NIOSH are actually being incorporated into USP 797. So I guess the, uh, the best advice I can give is you know, stay tuned and, and stay on top of this stuff because it, it, it will change again.